doesn't do anything. The lioness, she starts with us a little coming on, when they control. Still, nothing. No, the other animals, they notice this. And they start to move in. The jackals. Hyenas. They're barking at them, laughing at them. They never stop us. They eat the food. It's in this domain. They do this. And they get closer and closer and bolder and bolder. Until one day, a lion gets up and kills the shit out of everybody. Runs with the wind. Eats everything in his path. Because every once in a while, the lion has to show the jackals. Father God created us in order to have relationship with us. In order for us to have a relationship with our Father, there had to be a choice. There has to be two choices. He is, of course, one of the choices. There had to be an alternative choice. And for it to truly be a choice, it had to be an attractive choice. Enter Satan to provide that alternative choice. Job 1, 10 through 12, Satan. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Salvation is simple. If it was not simple, stupid people and small children would never get into heaven. You have to ask for forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. And second, we have to forgive everyone who has ever wronged us. This is hard, but think of them as spiritually handicapped, and they only hurt you out of their own hurt. Then give control of your life over to God by accepting His Son, Jesus' free gift of salvation for dying on the cross so that you could be saved from your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as a comforter to guide you through the rest of your earthly life and finally spend eternity in relationship with God in paradise. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door of the ark shall thou set in the side thereof, and lower and second and third story shall thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. 
And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Ron Wyatt from Kentucky devoted his life to discovering the archaeological evidence of the Bible. He began with Noah's Ark which he found exactly where the Bible said it was in the mountains of Arad. Next, he decided to find proof of where Moses crossed the Red Sea, to find proof of the chariots and the remains of soldiers who were drowned in the Red Sea. He found chariot wheels and all sorts of evidence that God did indeed save the Israelites from Pharaoh's army by splitting and opening up the Red Sea so that they could escape and drown Pharaoh's soldiers. In the early 1980s, Ron Wyatt, after years of Holy Spirit-inspired searching, discovered both the true site of Jesus' crucifixion, where three square cross holes were carved into Skull Hill, where the Bible says in John chapter 19, verses 17 through 18, he was indeed crucified. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Ron Wyatt discovered a crack in the center square which led directly to the Ark of the Covenant, buried in Jeremiah's grotto directly beneath the side of his crucifixion with his blood on the mercy seat as the final sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' blood proves conclusively that he is, was, and always will be the Jewish Messiah foretold in the Old Testament. Ron Wyatt, who died of cancer in 1999, maintained the truth of his discoveries until his death. Here it states, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, the ark, and the incense altar into it. Then he blocked up the entrance. The place shall remain unknown, he said until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again. When Christ died and the earth shook and the rocks were rent, a crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat, if you please, his earthly throne, to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C., when the Babylonian army destroyed the city, when the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum of the blood of the Son of God gushed out, went down through that crack onto the mercy seat. And that ratified the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. The furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow. Now, I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so do homosexuals and all of that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne, and it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup, so it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth or his residence where he once dwelt. And uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there.
and I started to say, you know, what are you doing here? And I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. One of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod, aim it at the Ark of the Covenant, and they went over lifted the mercy seat up. I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out. All right. They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on a rock ledge inside the chamber, and I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed, and I did everything the angel told me to do. Real quickly, okay, uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There's certain things they can do. They cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You can get a DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under a microscope. And the one technician called the other one over there. And then they called the boss over there. And they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit. And they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah.
and I assure you those men's lives have changed. Jesus' blood flowed out of his side, a crimson current onto the rocks below and onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, ratifying the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the New Testament, it mentions the blood hidden in the earth. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. In these free handouts, it gives these verses. Now, I'll share a couple of them with you. First John, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It says, there are three that bear witness in earth. Not in the earth, but in earth, meaning under the ground. Tables of stone are out of the Ark of the Covenant. They're in the chamber on this ledge as far as I know. But when God is ready for this to be shown to the world, and the angel told me it will be after the mark of the beast law is enforced. You understand that? You keep God's law, you have the seal of God. If you keep man's law, which soon will be passed, and if you refuse to keep their law, you can't buy or sell. If you keep their law, it requires that you break God's, and you have the mark of the beast, okay? You may know better and just go along with it, then you have it in your hand. Great disasters will cover the earth, which will bring on the time of trouble and the mark of the beast. There is a great controversy taking place today. The forces of darkness are warring against the forces of light in a great battle over our souls. In the near future, this will culminate during the Mark of the Beast showdown. Here we have two groups identified in two texts during this Mark of the Beast law. Here is the first group, the lost. They have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. These people have received the mark of the beast. The next group are the saved. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The saved are obeying the Ten Commandments during the mark of the beast law through the faith of Jesus. They have refused to follow a law of the beast and of the government, which goes contrary to the Ten Commandments. They have allowed the Holy Spirit to take over their lives to enable them to become overcomers and obedient to God's law. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Well, folks, the Ark of the Covenant has been found. The tables of stone are available. When God is ready, they will be shown to the inhabitants of this earth. And everyone will be made aware of what God requires of them. After hearing the story of Ron Wyatt, the Holy Spirit inspired me to paint this representation of the final sacrifice, to show people this great confirmation of his promise to us in the Old Testament. The VHS tape remains in Jeremiah's Grotto, where he left it until after the Mark of the Beast law is enforced. Could that have just happened during the COVID hysteria? where those who refuse to take the experimental emergency use authorized vaccines were not allowed to buy or sell. A shot that has firefly-derived Lucifer race in it, making your blood glow in your hand or your forehead so that when you travel, those in power know whether or not you took the Mark of the Beast shot. They are now scanning people's bodies for visible proof of vaccination showing the luciferase that's found in the vaccines at airports when you're trying to travel. Hi everyone, this is Hope Girl 
coming to you from hopegirlblog.com and ftwproject.com, where we make EMF protection products by hand. And we're doing this special report to show you what's going on in the world when it comes to traveling, that they are actually scanning people's bodies at the airports to try to find the luciferase that is lighting up in people's foreheads and people's hands and their arm injection sites. What you're about to watch is a special report interview that I'm doing with my friend Victor Hugo. He is an American who is a refugee trapped in the country of the Republic of Georgia. And he has firsthand account stories about friends of his who are trying to travel back home using fake vaccine passports. And they ended up getting stuck at the airport because they were scanned, their bodies were scanned in order to see if there was luciferase or not emanating from the vaccine sites. Um, and when they found that it wasn't there, they were like, this is a fake vaccine passport. They were detained at the airport in horrible conditions. And in some cases, they were forced to take the vaccine in order to return home to their connecting flights in their countries. In this report, we're going to show you the patents that show that luciferase is a real ingredient that is in these vaccines and being injected into the public without their knowledge. We're also going to review several videos where people are actually putting black lights on their injection sites to show that their bodies are glowing from the luciferase. We'll show you a video where the PCR test strips are also glowing from the luciferase. And we're going to cover a very important video showing the actual scanning technology and equipment at the airport where you can see for yourself with your own eyes how people's bodies are being scanned at the airport and their foreheads and their hands and their arms are lighting up under the black light. Then we'll be bringing in my husband, Tavon Rivers, who is a former Navy tech and engineer who will be describing the technology that's being used to do this so that we can better understand. And at the end of this report, Victor will be sharing with us new information regarding the link between 5G and these vaccines and how they are forcing the public to take on 5G cell phones in order to connect them to the internet of things. A couple of patents that I'll just put up on the screen here this, these are the patents that if you read through them, it actually shows you that there is luciferase in these COVID-19 injections or lethal injections. Um, and all the different uh, companies have been using them. So anyway, I wanted to show this other video here. We were just saying that it's in the, the, the PCR tests also have luciferase in them. So this is from the UK. These are your PCR test strips, and he's going to show how all of them are glowing. Uh, this is the video for the UK Freedom Warriors and Dan. Just to show you, I confiscated my parents' tests. They fucking glow. UV light. These motherfuckers, look at this. Normal fucking cotton wool bud. Oh, luciferase. Yeah. Fucking hell. This is just bad. Do not let your kids take these fucking tests unless you put a UV light under them. If they don't glow, they're fine to use, but these all fucking glow. This is where they come from. Made in China. I noticed that these, uh, 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 <laughs> these citizen journalists are a bunch of foul people. I mean, God bless them. At least hey. I'd, I'd rather hear the truth with a couple of F words than watch those talking heads on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News lying to us. So I, I think God will forgive the vulgarity. Yeah. Because at least people are getting the truth now. But uh, uh, I feel the same way. It's like, come on, we, we, we've heard all the words before. I want I want to let people express their raw emotions when they realize that they're all being murdered by their governments. You might drop an F-bomb every now and then when you come to that realization. Let's just let it yeah. fly. That's how I feel. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, def yeah I'm definitely noticed, noticing the anger. And what's going to happen is that anger is going to soon be projected from words into actions. And I do believe that these people will be showing up en masse to yes. uh, Bill Gates's house, to Fauci's house, and so on and so forth. So that's coming soon. All right, so this video um, is at the airport. This is showing the scanning equipment and
They do a close up of the screen, and you can see you see the foreheads lighting up and the arms lighting up. That's from the vaccines, from the luciferase in the vaccines. Which makes sense because the people who told me that they were they were pulled aside. Yep, they were pulled aside. Wow. Okay. Okay. So this is an example. See, there's the scanning machine. Oh, you got right a up camera there. there. You got it. There's the camera that's that's beaming it. Okay. Interesting. If you want, we can play it again one more time, just sure. so you okay. can. Yeah. Get it. First time I saw the camera on a uh, on a mount. So looking at the display from the camera. Going right into. The I haven't been in here for a long time. <laughs> yeah. About 10 years ago, I first met Dean Braxton, who, like many people who have experienced a near death experience or NDE, went to heaven for an hour and 45 minutes after dying in the hospital. He credits his family's prayers and songs of praise for bringing him back from paradise. Dean's testimony inspired me to paint these beautiful paintings of heaven and this one of Jesus in heaven praising his father's toes. When I showed it to Dean, he was amazed at how true the colors and the bright light was that radiated from God's toes, but said I was incorrect about my depiction of Jesus' hand. Dean told me exactly where to place the second hole in his wrist. He explained, the Romans wanted to ensure Jesus was not able to get off that cross. As Dean says, God needed him down here more than he needed him up in heaven. Parts of his heavenly experience with Jesus may be found in the book Imagine Heaven, which chronicles the years of research into the near-death experiences of people all over the world, including those who were blind from birth. Baker Books presents Imagine Heaven, near-death experiences, God's promises, and the exhilarating future awaiting you by John Burke. Read for you by Tristan Wright. The doctors told us my mom had only days to live. As she lay in the hospital for two weeks on her deathbed, I read the unedited manuscript of Imagine Heaven out loud to my sister and mom. I don't know if mom heard it from her comatose state, but by the end, my sister's comment was, I want to go with her. I felt the same, not in a death wish, morbid kind of way, but with a Christmas morning childlike excitement for the exhilarating life to come. I hope this book does the same for you. Although all of us face death, not all of us have an expectant hope for the future beyond this life. I believe that is because we just can't seem to imagine it. Imagine Heaven will undoubtedly help you do just that. Heaven and near-death experiences, NDEs, when people clinically died, were resuscitated, and claimed to have gotten a peek into the afterlife, have been a hot topic of late. Usually we're asked to take a person's word for it. But I've never been one to gullibly believe every story of seeing Heaven. As a result, this book has been slow coming. Over the past 35 years, I've read or heard close to 1,000 near-death stories. There are millions out there. I started seeing amazing commonalities across stories. Intriguing, detailed descriptions by doctors, professors, commercial airline pilots, children, people from around the globe. Each gave a slightly different angle to what started to look like a very similar picture. During that same 35-year time frame, I went from engineering to full-time ministry. The more I studied the Christian scriptures, on my own and in seminary, the more intriguing and confusing reading about NDEs became. Intriguing because so many of them described the picture of the afterlife found in the scriptures. Confusing because individual interpretations of their experiences could wildly vary and even seem at odds with the scriptures. After reading hundreds of NDE accounts, I started to see the difference between what they reported experiencing and the interpretation they might give to that experience. 
While interpretations vary, I found the shared core experience points to what the scriptures say. In fact, the more I studied, the more I realized that the picture scripture paints of the exhilarating life to come is the common experience that NDEers describe. Some Christians say that NDEs should be rejected because these tales of the afterlife deny the sufficiency of scripture and therefore add to God's revelation. I respectfully disagree. And I've included scriptural references throughout the book to show how aligned the scriptures actually are with the common experience. Do these experiences add color and detail that help us vibrantly imagine the life to come? Absolutely. Think about it this way. The scriptures tell us that all creation declares the glory of God. See Psalm 19.1. But if you actually witness a glorious sunset of explosive colors, where the bluest Hawaiian ocean crashes into the majestic mountain-lined beaches of gold, now you've experienced the black and white words of scripture in a color-saturated way that can glorify God even more. Near-death experiences do not deny or supplant what scripture says. They add color to scripture's picture. But of course, like any gift from God, people can miss what God wants them to understand, misinterpret the experience, or even worship the gift instead of the gift giver. I include well over 100 stories of people who were clinically dead or near death and revived and had amazing details to report. Some of them I personally interviewed, but most I compiled from reading. Given this, I cannot vouch for each individual's authenticity or credibility. Some NDEers I will quote because their reported experience correlates with other experiences in scripture. Yet I do not agree with their interpretations or conclusions. And even if some turn out to be fraudulent, like the boy who made up a near-death story for attention, this does not concern me, because the stories I've chosen could be replaced with many others describing much of the same things. I also do not advise forming a worldview of the afterlife from a few people's interpretations. But what I'm trying to do is show you something amazing that I think God is showing me. I'm writing from the perspective of a convinced Christian, but I was not always convinced. I've studied the world's religions, and as a former skeptic, my passion is helping skeptical people consider the many reasons that keep me believing. If you're still skeptical about God, the afterlife, or even religious leaders, this is the book for you. You will get a thorough understanding of the picture of heaven from the Bible, but don't worry, this isn't like a theology textbook. It reads more like a novel. If nothing else, it will open your eyes to the millions of accounts out there that have convinced skeptical doctors, atheistic college professors, and many others, all whose stories you'll read, that heaven is real. Could people make up stories or fabricate detail to sell more books? Yes. For this reason, I've tried to choose stories from people with little to no profit motive. Orthopedic surgeons, commercial airline pilots, professors, neurosurgeons. People who probably don't need the money but have credibility to lose by making up wild tales. I've also included children, people from predominantly Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist countries, and people who did not write books. Amazingly, they all add color to a similar grand picture of the afterlife. And that's my main motive in writing this book, to help you imagine heaven, so you'll see how wise it is to live for it, plan for it, and make sure you're prepared for a safe arrival someday. Two days after reading this book to my mom and sister in the hospital, my mom breathed her last. My sister and I were in the room, hugging, blessing my mother, and celebrating with her, because we knew in that moment she had come alive. Alive like she hadn't been in years. Alive like she'd never been before. Alive like you've never imagined. So join me on this journey. And let's imagine heaven. You have to ask for forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. And second, we have to forgive everyone who has ever wronged us. This is hard, but think of them as spiritually handicapped, and they only hurt you out of their own hurt. Then give control of your life over to God by accepting His Son, Jesus' free gift of salvation for dying on the cross so that you could be saved from your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit.
as a comforter to guide you through the rest of your earthly life and finally spend eternity in relationship with God in paradise.